All right. All right, so let's give this a go. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for having me here. It's wonderful to be here today. We're gonna start off with uh, a picture. Now this is, uh, this is a village, and this is a village in the central part of the Ivory Coast. This picture was taken about a month ago. I was working here with some physicians, local physicians, local public health professionals, and we were doing a, a screening and treatment program for common parasitic infections that are in this part of the Ivory Coast. Things like you know, malaria and intestinal parasitic infections. Now this is the health outpost, and this is the health outpost we were based out of. It's a great little place, it serves the local community, and it's very similar to health outposts that you're gonna see throughout most of rural Africa and also most of the developing world. It's, uh, it's run by a nurse, as most health, health outposts are. There's uh, limited uh, physicians in, in, the, devel in the, the developing world. It's got uh, some basic diagnostic tests that are available. It does mostly primary care, like family medicine, but there's a few beds in there in case someone gets sick, they can uh, stay overnight. And, you know, it's got intermittent electricity, there's frequent power outages, it's very typical. So I'm working there with a, a local team, we're doing our thing, I'm on the balcony of this health outpost, it's very hot so I have to work outside, and I hear a little whimper coming from inside. So I peek my head through the window, and I see this tragic scene unfolding. There's this kid, probably about the same age as my daughter. He's lying in bed, he looks really, really sick. Uh, he's hooked up to an IV, he's getting lots of medications. His parents are there, they're hovering over the bedside, they look very, very concerned. He's being tended to by the nurse, who's, like I said, the most senior clinician at this health outpost. And I asked the nurse, you know, what's wrong with this kid? What's, what's up, what, what, what's going on here? And she says, I'm not sure, it's probably malaria. And again, this really reflects one of one of, uh, one of the major issues with healthcare delivery in the developing world, and this is a sick, sick, sick person who's getting lots of different drugs, and we don't even know what the diagnosis is. We can't even make a diagnosis. This is tragic, and this is very preventable. And if, like I said, this is reflective of many issues with healthcare delivery in the developing world. One, a lack of access to appropriate diagnostic tests, but there's also many other issues. There's uh, sometimes treatments aren't available, or if they are available, they are too expensive. Uh, lots of resources are clustered in urban settings and not in uh, the periphery, so people often have to travel to get care. There's uh, several issues with losing very quality individuals, talented physicians to middle-income and high-income countries. These are, these are complicated problems. You know, and of course there's no easy solutions to this. There's no silver bullet. We're never going to fix this problem right away with one simple solution. This is going to take time and pressure. This is going to be, uh, you know, we're going to have to focus on capacity building, on quality improvement. It's going to take community grassroots support. It's going to take public and private sectors, you know, all level of government, maybe international support as well. But are there some, you know, simple solutions? Is there some piece of this much larger complex puzzle that we could put into place? And I really want to focus on diagnostic testing, because maybe this is one area that we can focus on where we can really put something into place to help clinicians guide the treatment of, of patients. Now, what happens in a situation like this when a clinician can't make a diagnosis? What happens is they, they treat patients empirically. And what that means is you're covering a disease or an infection, you're treating a disease or an infection, but you haven't actually confirmed that it's there. And usually we cover things that are common or dangerous. So certain things that we cover empirically, that we treat empirically would be, you know, tuberculosis, malaria, bacterial infections, uh, typhoid, you know, these are, these are common things. And this has major, major implications. It has implications at an individual level. It also has major implications at a public health level. So, at, you know, when you think of patients being treated empirically for things, that really amounts to lots of drugs that are being given that don't have to be given. This amounts to a lot of prescriptions that are written that don't need to be written. And like I said, there's huge individual implications and implications at, at a, a more macro level. At the individual level, you know, drugs aren't cheap. People are spending very limited resources on medications that they might not need. Drugs aren't benign. You can have an adverse uh, outcome from a medication, and it's horrible if you have this with a, a medication that you didn't need in the first place. And lastly, sometimes clinicians uh, are, are a little bit off, and maybe someone's getting treated empirically for malaria, for example, but they're sick and dying of something completely different, like a bacterial infection. This is common, and this is tragic, and this is completely preventable. You know, at, at a more macro level, at a population level, what we've seen is the the indiscriminate use of many of these antibiotics has caused 
what really amounts to a global health catastrophe, because what we're seeing now is terrible, terrible drug resistance in things like tuberculosis, malaria, bacterial infections, HIV. I mean, this is, this is awful. And, you know, you think, well, what are some good solutions to this? Is there something we can do? Can we create a, a diagnostic test that might, be, that might be really helpful? And we try and think of, a, you know, a diagnostic test that will help guide clinicians to treat patients appropriately, and we can narrow our spectrum of disease down. And you're, you're trying to think of what, what makes a good diagnostic test, especially one that will be useful in a setting like the one we were just discussing. And you think, this test should be pretty inexpensive. It should work. It should be a quality test. Um, it should be portable, light and portable, because we're working in some really remote, rural, underserviced areas. It should be available to people of all levels of training, not just highly skilled specialists. You know, these are some of the attributes we'd, uh, we'd, we'd sort of, uh, we'd really want a, a good diagnostic test to have. And when you're trying to think of what, what this would look like, you know, maybe we're thinking about some technologically advanced little gizmo, but I'd argue that the best diagnostic test we have is also probably the most underutilized diagnostic test, and that's really the history and the physical examination. Now, this is invaluable, because really what the history and the physical examination does is it enables clinicians to distill this infinite possibility of conditions and diseases down into a much more manageable list, and it helps clinicians choose their tests wisely such that they can rule in or rule out a certain condition. This will save time, this will save money, and inevitably this will save lives. But we need more. And as you can see, we need some tests that will help rule in and rule out certain diseases and certain infections. And we're, we're really working in challenging environments in parts of the developing world because there's very little infrastructure for diagnostic testing. And what we thought, and I say we because what I'm talking about is really shared ideas and shared innovations from you know, doctors, nurses, public health professionals, engineers from all over Africa, Europe, Canada, United States. What we really wanted to do was find a good solution to this and something that we could take so we could take really lab-based technology and bring it out to some of these more rural, uh, resource-constrained environments. And what we did was, uh, we turned our mobile phones into microscopes. Now, this is not an advertisement, this just happened to be the mobile phone I was using at the time. But what we did was, we, we took our mobile phones and we, we, we bought a little glass ball lens. Uh, you can get it off the internet for a few bucks. And all we did was, we just taped the glass ball to the lens of the camera on our mobile phones. And when you turn on the camera, voila, your mobile phone turns into a microscope. That's pretty neat. So we took these devices to rural Tanzania and to uh, a rural part of the Ivory Coast, and we implemented them in some community-based and school-based screening and treatment programs for common parasitic infections. And lo and behold, we were able to diagnose lots of intestinal parasites with this. Great, neat, fantastic. Here we are, we have a portable device, it kind of works. Uh, you know, intestinal parasites, gross, it made it into the newspaper, you don't see that every day. And you, know, you probably have a couple of burning questions, you know, the answer is yes, that means you have to put your mobile phone <laughs> really close to pee and poo that's infected with parasites, and you know, no, we don't have a lot of funding, and we were using our own phones for this, but we washed them down after, and I guess this really begs the question of, you know, what happens if you're examining a slide and your mom calls in the middle of it. Are you going to answer the phone or not? That never happened. And I probably wouldn't answer the phone. But anyways, you know, this was needed. It generated a little bit of hype. But here's the problem. This worked, but it just didn't work that well. You know, we were missing some infections here and there. It was just, it's a very crude thing. I mean, really, we just taped a ball lens onto our mobile phone. This is about as crude as it gets. So, we went back to being doctors and nurses and public health providers, and we started speaking with people that knew a thing or two about microscopy. We started speaking with a few companies and with some uh, engineers based out of the University of California. And what these individuals are up to is they're creating portable mobile phone-based microscopes. And again, these have all the attributes we were talking about earlier. They're, they're light, they're portable, you don't have to plug it into the wall because there's, the, you know, there's intermittent electricity, they work, that's good. And in addition to that, because it's mobile phone-based, you can snap a picture, if you don't know what you're looking at, great, send it as a text or an email to a friend, maybe they can help you out. You can map the GPS coordinates of 
you know, infections and parasites, so you can map parasites or infections or diseases throughout. Like, this, is, this has some fantastic, um, fantastic attributes. Now, you know, critics are going to say, whoa, well, give me a break. You know, mobile phones, like, those are expensive, or, you know, good luck trying to send a text message in rural Ivory Coast. But really, mobile phones are everywhere including smartphones, and they're in rural Africa as well. The costs have come down dramatically, and you can use any mobile phone. It just needs to have a good camera function. And the wireless network, even in the remotest part of the developing world, is fantastic. These just haven't been the barriers that we thought they were going to be. And then you say to yourself, well, <laughs> you know, who cares, right? Who cares? Who cares if the Canadian physician can take some nifty little device and go into rural Africa and make a diagnosis of a parasitic infection. You know, what, what does that do for anyone? You know, what is this, diagnose, then adios? Like, this does, this does nothing. So what we're doing now is we're getting some of these devices donated, and we're putting them into the hands of people that will use them in day-to-day -day settings. Not just African physicians, but African public health workers and laboratory technicians. Now, these are the people that are working at places like this. And really, the aim is to enable anyone of all levels of training to make a diagnosis so that they can help guide appropriate medical care. Now, you remember that little boy I was talking about when we were on the veranda of this, uh, of this health outpost? You know, this guy was lucky. He lived. He walked out. But there's countless other people that are not as lucky to live like this boy did. And we can do better. And really, that is our aim here, is to really enable people of all backgrounds to make an appropriate diagnosis. Now, this is the same veranda, and that's the window I was peeking through. And these are the public health providers, and these are the lab techs that are learning how to use some of these new diagnostic tools. Like I said, ultimately, the aim is to improve the quality of care that we can provide in clinical settings and public health settings that are most in need. Thank you very much for your time.